Christmas, 1965. If Goldfinger kicked off Bond mania, then Thunderball kicked off a Bondapalooza, with the film playing to even bigger business than its predecessor, cementing the fact that Goldfinger was not a one-off. James Bond was here to stay, and Hollywood took notice. The result, a little known chapter in the Bond franchise that I'm sure the folks at Eon Pictures would much rather you forget. Casino Royale. <laughs> No, not the one with Daniel Craig. That's a shame. Flashback to the year 1966, and Hollywood is positively inundated with James Bond clones. Over at 20th Century Fox, there's our man Flint, with James Coburn starring as super spy Derek Flint. We need a man who can follow regulations. We need a man who's disciplined. I'm Flint. Huh? Flint. 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 I don't care what these computers say, I know this man. A James Bond spoof that kicked off a franchise of its own with a sequel in Like Flint that would have likely continued on if Coburn had stayed interested in the character. Albert R. Broccoli's former producing partner, Irvin Allen, who turned down the chance to get involved with the James Bond films originally, optioned Donald Hamilton's grim spy, Matt Helm, and promptly turned him into a wacky Bond-like figure played by none other than a very boozy, very hungover, I presume, Dean Martin, who was then at the height of his Rat Pack prime. You know, a drink never hurt nobody at all. You just remember the great words of Mr. Joey Lewis. He says, you're not drunk if you can lay on the floor without holding on. <laughs> As the constantly woozy Matt Helm in a franchise that ran four pretty bad installments, The Silencers, Murderer's Row, The Ambushers, and finally The Wrecking Crew, which infamously featured Sharon Tate in her last big screen role before, you know, the thing. In Europe, Bond movies were even more in vogue with Richard Johnson playing a very dapper and Bond-like bulldog drummond in Deadlier Than the Male and its follow-up Some Girls Do, while a whole genre dubbed Eurospy flooded the market with 007 clones. This was memorably sent up in Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where Leonardo DiCaprio's character stars in a Bond clone called Operazione Dynamite. The absolute most infamous of the 007 clones was a movie called Operation Kid Brother that starred Connery. No, no, not that one. Rather, his plasterer brother, Neil Connery. But much more on that in the next installment. Thanks to Ian Fleming having sold the rights to Casino Royale some years before, Columbia and Super Agent Charles Feldman actually own the rights to the novel and they could legally make their own James Bond film. They initially planned to make a serious James Bond picture and even approach Sean Connery to play the lead, who said he'd do it for a cool million dollars. Feldman initially planned to do as Kevin McClory did with Thunderball, team with Eon on an official James Bond film, but they could not come to terms. Aware that the market was being flooded with Bond clones, Feldman, not unreasonably, figured that he couldn't compete with the real James Bond series and came up with an initially inspired idea, a big budget all-star James Bond spoof. The film unfathomably was split up among not one, not two, or even three or four, but rather five directors. The writer's list was even longer with everyone from Woody Allen to Billy Wilder having a go. The result was one of the messiest films ever made, despite having one of the best casts of the 60s, including Peter Sellers, David Niven, original Bond girl Ursula Andres, William Holden, Woody Allen, Jean Pelbelmondo, well, for a couple of seconds, and the great Orson Welles starring as the villainous Le Chiffre. So what went wrong? Two words, Peter Sellers. At the time, Sellers, well, clearly was not well in a mental way. His ego simply got the better of him from day one, and when he signed on to star as the nerdy Evelyn Tremble, a Bakra master hired to pose as James Bond and defeat Le Chiff at the card tables, which I have to say isn't a bad idea for a Bond spoof, and as a storyline that's not even that far removed from the novel, everything just went haywire. Sellers, for some reason, decided to play the whole thing relatively straight. He actually wanted to be James Bond in a serious movie, thinking he was Sean Connery. No one could get a handle on him, and his bad behavior was exacerbated when he had to work with Orson Welles, who he had actually fought to get cast as Le Chiffre. What happened is Hollywood lore. Princess Margaret had been due to visit Sellers on the set, and he'd been bragging about it for weeks. 
claiming he was close to the royal family. So she showed up, but promptly ran into the arms of awaiting Orson Welles, who she'd known for years and who, well, everybody thought was the greatest guy ever. Sellers was so humiliated that he absolutely refused to film any scenes opposite Orson Welles, who, of course, was amused by Sellers' behavior and certainly didn't make things any better knowing exactly how to attack his co-star's ego from day one. All of their sequences had to be shot separately. Now, these weren't the only issues. Sellers was known for throwing his weight around on set at the time, and his behavior was particularly horrifying this time. His first day working with his young co-star Jacqueline Bissett, he horrifyingly discharged a gun loaded with blanks in her face, an act that would put him in jail nowadays, but back then was just kind of shrugged off as movie star behavior. This left her face coated in very real gunpowder and bleeding from where the shards tore her skin, and she said afterwards that she was absolutely terrified of him. He also punched out one of his directors, Joseph McGrath, after being confronted about his bad behavior, and finally, finally wound up being fired, but it took a lot. Of course, this left the finished film a bit of a mess, but luckily they had David Niven as one of the co-stars who plays Sir James Bond and by all accounts was a lovely guy. I think I could fancy you. Well, that's very good of you, my dear. Rather warm in here, don't you think? Cool it, Charlie. He plays an older, more refined model for 007, who's kind of annoyed at the fact that there's a very real James Bond in this universe who's going around sleeping with women and blowing things up. He's much more of an English gentleman and thinks the whole thing is rather distasteful. Good lord, it's my nephew. Jimmy Bond? This explains the Caribbean assignment. Still, the film ended up being so episodic in nature that none of Niven's charm, and his rather charming sort, could save the finished product. So let's break it down. The script and direction for Casino Royale is an absolute nightmare, but that's what happens when you have a dozen writers and five directors. Not only is it episodic and schizophrenic, but in the biggest sin of all for a comedy, it's not even the least bit funny. The only giggles come when Woody Allen's Jimmy Bond Jr. christens himself as a villain named Dr. Noah, who plans to set off a bomb that will kill all men over four foot six and make all women beautiful. Dr. Noah's bacillus is highly contagious. This germ, when distributed in the atmosphere, will make all women beautiful and destroy all men over four foot six. Yeah, not exactly PC, is it? The villains, for the most part, aren't meant to be taken seriously here, but the filmmakers did have one ace up their sleeves. Orson Welles, who could and should have been a legit Bond villain and is smooth and menacing as Le Chiff. For the baddies, I'd give this a five just because Orson Welles is so cool. Aren't you a little out of your depths, Mr. Bond? I'll say this, though. The one area Casino Royale kind of comes out on top of is that it casts some of the most beautiful women of the era in major roles. There's Barbara Boucher as Money Punny's beautiful daughter, Joanna Patet as Mata Bond, the daughter of Niven's Sir James Bond and Mata Hari, who gets kind of an episode of her own. If you ever wanted to see what a James Bond movie would be like with a female James Bond, in a way, this is kind of your opportunity. There's also Dahlia Lavi as another female James Bond. Now, this is a plot line. Every secret agent in the film is called James Bond. I don't want to get into it. It's really stupid. And then finally, there's screen legend Deborah Kerr as Sir James Bond's love interest, the widow of his old boss M, who's played by the delightful John Huston, who was also directing in a cameo. And of course, there's Ursula Andress in an inexplicable role as Vesper Lind, right out of the Ian Fleming books, but whose scenes make virtually no sense because her co-star was fired. Oh well, at least she's gorgeous and gets to use her original voice this time, unlike Dr. No, where she was dubbed. James Bond doesn't wear glasses. Yes, I do that. It's just that I like to see who I'm shooting. The writing is abysmal, but the girls are stunning, and I give it a 7 on 10. The score, however, is the only thing that makes Casino Royale worth watching, really. With Burt Bacharach composing a cool 60s lounge score with a fun theme by Herb Alpert, as well as the immortal tune The Look of Love by Dusty Springfield, which is a far bigger hit than the film itself. Otherwise, None of the markers of a James Bond film, from the kill count to the gadgets, can be applied here, as the film is really just one big joke, which I give an abysmal 4 on 10. However, audiences still turned out to see it, with it grossing $22.7 million at the box office, unfathomable for such a bad movie, making it the 13th biggest film of the year, although its box office receipts would have dire consequences on the franchise, but more on that next time, as James Bond will return in you only live twice.